It's my personality to love to help others and also to like collaborate. And, I, and that's really what syndication is. Like we're offering people, you know, we got investors who are dentists, doctors, teachers. They just have extra cash, but they don't have time or they don't necessarily want to spend the time to learn what a good investment looks like. So you're providing this opportunity for your friends and family and it's also benefiting you. So for me, it's also like this connection piece. We're all more or less working together for one end game. Typically speaking, it's always a risk, right? But typically you're gonna make some money in these investments. So that's part one. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. Today's guest, Eric Nelson, is the founding principal of Wild Oak Capital. He's been investing in real estate for over 10 years. Eric and the Wild Oak Capital team provide investment opportunities through multifamily syndication. We're going to talk about this transition into syndication. He's also the host of the Real Estate Mindset Podcast, which you can see right behind his head there, where he discusses with industry leaders what it takes to be a successful investor based on continuous personal and professional growth. Eric and his wife, Marie, have two young boys and love to spend time outdoors at their home in Southwest Colorado. El Eric, man, welcome. No, oh, Jamie, thanks for having me, man. It's my pleasure. Pretty excited to be here. So thanks for having me on. Excited to have you, man. And as a reminder to all of you, go to GoBundance.com. Make sure you apply for membership. We've got a community no matter your net worth, men, women, or otherwise. So jump on GoBundance.com. Well worth your time and effort for that. All right, Eric, let's start with a little bit of backstory. I mentioned that you're syndicating deals now. You've got Wild Oak. You've got the Real Estate Mindset Podcast. But there's an engineering side to you. There's all of this other stuff. Give us the, the five-minute story. What's the what's the beginnings of you through now? Yeah. So, I mean, I think what's interesting is like, I, you know, I had like a kind of standard American upbringing, more or less. You know what I mean? Like my parents were middle class and kind of the whole go to school get a degree, get a job. And so I subscribed to that, right? Like I went to school, studied civil engineering, got out, got a job. And my wife and I, it was almost like we knew immediately. It was like, well, this, this kind of sucks. <laughs> like this, this is going to be a long time of this. Um, so we ended up like kind of traveling a little bit, uh, you know, switching jobs, trying to find our way, I guess you could say. And, and so what we ended up doing was taking a year off and actually driving um, like a little truck camper from Colorado all the way to the bottom of South America. So that was like this year for us to sort of determine what we want to do. And so what I decided was, okay, I have the skill of engineering, but I still have this entrepreneurial spirit. So I just started an engineering company and that was cool because I could be my own boss, sort of make my own hours, pick and choose the jobs more or less. I mean, we were kind of blessed to have lots of work. It's been a pretty good time. I mean, for all markets in the last 10 years, right? So um, kind of started all that, but then, you know, kind of got the bug of like, well, I don't have a retirement account and what can we do? And just started thinking about other stuff. Right. So before I had any knowledge whatsoever, we just decided to buy a rental house, like a couple blocks from our house. Hmm. And, uh, that got me kind of started down the path and I didn't do any math. Basically it was like, oh, well, here's the mortgage. Here's the rent. They're about the same over time. I'll probably make money. Like that, that's about as far as I went. And then a good friend of mine, of course, like, you know, I think everyone has the same story too. It's like, Hey, have you ever heard of bigger pockets? And I was like, no. And so I started listening to the podcast, reading books, you know, like, Oh, there is like kind of a business to this. Right. And so that was, I don't know, eight years ago, maybe. Um, yeah. Right around there. So since then just kind of grown just gradually, right? Like we were saving up money, buying more singles, bought a sixplex, bought a quad, bought a threeplex, and then a good friend of mine was doing syndications and he was like, Hey man, I think, I think you should think bigger. I think you should, you know, pursue maybe partnerships, other stuff like that. And that was kind of a limiting belief I had was like, I want to do it all on my own with my wife. You know, I really want partners. I want control all that stuff. And through some work and, and honestly, like good mentorship, um, I was able to shift my mind a little and, and head down the partnership route. And so What's happened is we've we've done we're closing on our sixth syndication this year, so we've had really good success wow. recently. Um, and what's what's also happened with engineering is like I'm kind of just dialing my time back there, you know, like so it's a unique structure where I can do more real estate and less engineering, and just kind of eventually I'll phase out. And my plan is by June of 23, which is about eight months from now, be pretty much totally done with engineering, unless it's like you know, a job for a friend or something I really want to do, but generally speaking, be done with engineering by that time. So that's kind of the, the professional background. And then I've got two young boys. I got a five-year-old boy and a three-year-old 
and that keeps me pretty busy as well. I feel you, man. Seven and four, seven and four. So uh, representing, representing the uh, the toddler plus crowd, I guess. <laughs> That's right. Um, man. <laughs> and boys, boy dads, hashtag boy, boy dads. So. Hashtag boy dads, hashtag young boy dads, hashtag busy. <laughs> <laughs> so are you sure you're an engineer? Because I heard you say that you didn't look at one number and you bought a house sight on, oh, not sight unseen, <laughs> but like, just like, ah, yeah, sure. That sounds yeah. like the opposite of every engineer I know. Like most engineers are ready, aim, 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 aim. But what, like, what, what made you just fire? Like why, why, why was that? Is that natural for you? Is that kind of how you live life? Or was that sort of a, I don't know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I love the question. I think most people who meet me and we like spend a little time together will describe me as a very atypical engineer. And so truthfully, I mean, the only reason I would say I'm an engineer is because I was good at math. Like in high school, I was just excelled at math, right? It's just, I'm not bragging. It's just one of those skills. And so my parents are like, oh, you should be an engineer. <laughs> and that's kind of like the that's path tricky. I took. Uh, <laughs> but I definitely prefer more of this. Like I prefer more like people skills, soft skills, um, I maybe should have been a salesman who knows. Right. But like I, I finished school and just started doing engineering and I do enjoy it, but it, the detail isn't really my forte. So, you know, knowing that was actually a skill in itself too. So I partnered with someone who's awesome and, and he's incredibly detailed. And so the two of us make a very good team, but to answer your question, I'm, I'm not really your typical engineer. Like I'll focus for sure when I'm doing the work, cause it's so important, but yeah. you know, in my day-to-day -day life, yeah, I tend to be a little bit more loosey-goosey. And so, you know, with Wild Oak Capital, for, for an example, like our underwriter, he's extremely, extremely smart, extremely detailed, and just much better at it than I am. I mean, even though I could do it, it just wasn't my favorite thing or maybe best thing. So, yeah, I mean, I love the question. It's, it's uh, you know, it's not really who I am per se. And that's, that's what's kind of nice is to shift my my mind to say, yeah, I'm a real estate investor rather than I'm an engineer. There's a, there's a, you could, you could be the atypical engineer. You could build a brand, the, the atypical engineer or the extroverted engineer or something like that. That would yep. be great. Uh, <laughs> how's that, how's that house worked out? I'm curious. Uh, we sold it. So the house did work out. We made some money again. I mean, I think the market kind of helped. Um, so that one was, that one was funny. Like, um, Again, it was kind of down the street. I live in Colorado and the market here resembles more like a California market. Yeah. So the entrance point's so high that it is kind of hard to cash flow. Um, but I wanted to buy something local. You know, I think a lot of people want to early on. And so that one worked out okay. We made some money on the sale, but like I mentioned, I mean, cash flow is basically zero. So that one worked out fine. The exit was good because, you know, appreciation just completely went through the roof. Um, and that's true of another sixplex we bought here too, which is actually a really cool story I'm happy to talk about, but got a sixplex here locally on a really unique owner finance situation. Mm. And um, we were making a little bit of money month over month, but we made a lot on the exit. Just, just you know, partly market, partly skill. And uh, do you mind running the numbers on that real quick? What did you buy it for? Yeah, no, what the terms? Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. So, um, here, I'll just tell the whole story real quick. Basically, I would walk, my son was a baby and I would just walk the streets. And, and if I saw a for rent sign, I would just call it and be like, Hey, I, I, you know, your house is really nice. I'm not looking to rent, but I'm looking to buy. Would you look to sell, you know, a little longer than that? Most people, of course, like, no, no, thanks. And I was like, okay, see you later. You know, I made hundreds of those calls and it got a couple of things. One, I got to know the market really well. And two, I got pretty good at just being denied <laughs> and being okay with it. Uh, and this one was cool. Like it was a multifamily property. I'd, I kind of seen it before, never really paid attention. I saw this gentleman out front, like putting the for rent sign on the ground, like physically. And he's older, like 65 ish, I would guess. Um, and so I just, I just walked up to him and I said, Hey, beautiful property. You know, can you tell me a bit about it? I see you're renting it. What are you renting it for? Kind of started that conversation. And, um, you know, he was like, yeah, and he just seemed kind of tired. And I was like, well, look, I'm, I'm not look, looking to rent, but I am interested to buy. And he was basically like, oh man, well, it's almost like he'd never thought of it, you know? Wow. So he told me he inherited it. He told me he had lived there and he told me he was pretty much tired of, of renting. So I was like, all right, well, how about this? Think on it, talk with your wife and I'll call you in a couple of days and we'll, we'll talk some more. So I called him and he was like, okay, yeah, but I, you know, I need a million dollars. 
And don't get me wrong, a million dollars is a lot of money, but in my market for a sixplex, it's actually a pretty good deal. Yeah. And so my, my mind was like, wow, that's, you know, to him, that was just this enormous amount of money that no one in the world would pay. Right. That's why he sure. chose that number, I think. And so I was like, all right, yeah, I think we can pay that. Um, but we don't have the money to put down on a traditional loan. Like, I know you inherited it. Have you ever thought of owner financing? And he's like, well, what's that? So it kind of walked that path too. And I was like, well, here's basically how it works. Talk to your lawyer, talk to your wife. I'll call you in a couple of days. And so kind of did that whole repeat thing, called him. He's like, yeah, I think I understand it. I think it would work really well. Let's go for it. And it sounds good, but here's the catch. We don't have a lot to put down. So I offered him 35 grand down, three and a half percent down Come on. and a 40 year amortization. I think the rate was four and a half percent interest rate. And he was like, sounds good. Oh Let's my God. Was there a term or was it just 40 years? No, there's no balloon. I said <laughs> there may have been a 10 year, like long enough that I was like, okay, Whatever. that's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was, that was the deal. And then we went to his lawyer's office to, cause he's like, can we use my lawyer? I'm like, sure. He can draft up the contract. I'm fine with that. So we went there and his lawyer was like, man, I don't know if you should be doing this. And he kind of looks at me, you know, the seller looks at me and I'm like, dude, I'm not forcing your hand, but here's the worst case scenario. Right. I don't pay you. You get your house back. Plus all the fixes I've done are done. Right? Like it's a pretty good scenario for you. Plus I live right up the street. Like, right. you know, where I live, you've met my son. Like I've never missed a payment in my life. And if I have to, I'll, I'll be honest and all that stuff. So he was like, all right, let's do it. So yeah, we ended up buying it for a million bucks. Um, there was a down unit. So he had his, he had a bunch of stuff in this one unit. So that was the one like kicker for me. It was like, man, once we get that unit on, we can like. So it was five plus a down unit or is it six plus a down unit? Five plus a down unit. Five plus yeah. Down. Got it. Uh -huh. And so um, we ended up cash flowing maybe around 1800 bucks a month, give or wow. take It's an older property. So it needed some love. So I put about, yeah. And, and I was doing a lot of the work myself at the time. Like I had the time and had the skills to do that. And then uh, I host a meetup and someone from our meetup came up to me. was like, Hey, do you know anyone selling a multifamily property? And I was like, you know what? Um, I don't, but I have one I would sell. And so what was cool was, I called the, the seller, the old seller, who's now the lender. And I said, Hey, I'm looking to sell this property potentially. Um, and I know that you like this deal. Would you consider carrying this note on with, for the next person? And he's like, yeah, I'd like to meet him, but sure. So the new buyer bought it for like 1.15, I think it was. So we ended up making about 150 grand on the deal. How Maybe long? a little under. Like how long did you own it? Like you uh, under a year. It was oh, pretty wow. quick. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was a win, win, win. Cause the seller carried the note, which he likes, you know, he liked that kind of monthly income. The new buyer was like, sweet, man, I don't have to go out and find finance for a sixplex. And so we only had to put, uh, the difference down between my original note, which was, you know, nine sixty five, and I hadn't paid it down much. Mm -hmm. Plus it was 1.15 was the sales price. So I had put about 20 grand in. So I, I actually made more like one thirty on it, but in under a year, you know, with, with 65 grand out, we made about 150 or 130 or so on that deal. Amazing. That's incredible. I love the the story there is just the effort, right? Like I go on these walks with my kid. I make a few phone calls, a few, well, you make a bunch of phone calls and, it, and this wasn't even a phone call, right? You kind of stumbled upon the guy, but the point is you were in the mindset of uh, you were taking the, we call it like an emerge, we call it taking the reps, right? Those, those reps that you're going through that lead to the outcomes of, like you said, less than a year, 60, uh, 35 in whatever it was and making $130,000 or whatever on this property, which is incredible as the, the, so the new owner kept the note as well. That's incredible. So the new buyer yeah. got these yeah. terms. Yeah. So he's got that 40 year AM. Oh my God. Um, I think they, I think they renegotiated the balloon because I mean, it still was way out there, but I think they did do some renegotiation. Um, but yeah, so he was excited because I didn't like sell him and pay him off, you know? And then the new buyer was excited again, because it was, it was very good terms. And so I still, to this day, know them both. Like one of them, the, the guy who bought it property still comes to my meetup. Yeah. So we're still chatting and he'll be like, oh man, the, you know, I had to repair the roof, but overall it's going well, like stuff like that. So it's, it's just cool, man. Like real estate is, is more of a people game than, than oh, we all no. want to admit, but it's all no, based on people and relationships. Well, it's the number one question I get asked, uh, uh, or the number one answer to the question that I get asked, which is how do you vet 
a deal? Like, what's the what? What you know? What are your, what what terms are you looking for? I'm like, I really don't. And I, I think most people would say is I don't look for terms. Like, that's not everybody's got similar terms, right? Within within a percentage point or two or whatever. But it's like I'd rather take lesser terms with a really good operator that I know, like, and trust than the best terms I can find with somebody I don't know. So to your point, yeah, the the way to vet a deal and understand if it's a good deal or not is are the operators trustworthy? Are they, are they good operate? You know, like, are they good or not? That's, that's the gist of it. It's a people business to your point. So. Dude, now, you, yeah. You good operators, s- yeah. Go ahead. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I just totally agree. I like, couldn't, I mean, there's nothing really more to say. I mean, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so you get six syndications. You had the single family of the six, six plex and everything else. Do you have anything? Do you, do you hold anything long-term or do you have anything that you're holding long-term currently? I do. Yeah. We have a, uh, 11 or so rentals, like more or less still in my, my wife's not my name. We plan to hold fairly long-term. And then we've got a couple of JVs. Like there's an eight plex I own in Texas with a partner, actually two partners. One's my brother and one's like an investor. And um, that's a pretty sweet deal. We plan to hold that one for a while, but then beyond that, no, like basically what I did was sold quite a few of our rentals that were here in Colorado. Cause again, yeah. it, they weren't really cash flow. Like, appreciation was there and it's been a pretty decent time to sell. So we ended up selling the majority of the stuff here and either putting our money in our deals, which I like to do. I like to invest alongside our, our investors um, or yeah, like finding this, maybe an eight plex or something. So I have a, I would say a mix of both. Um, some we plan to hold and, and then a lot of our money's in, in syndication. It was obviously, you know, five to seven year kind of turnaround. Yeah, it's funny. I'm in that spot right now where I'm exiting everything that I actively own, and not not intentionally. It's not like a hey, I'm going to get rid of everything. It just worked out that way. Like mm-hmm. we had a couple of properties in New York. We're just getting too far detached, and really the connection there was my parents are there. They're close by if something happens or whatever. But you know, my dad's getting older. It just was like you know what the market's decent when we got rid of it. Let's get rid of these properties, two duplexes, and then in in Michigan we just sold our last sixteen unit, and there was a twenty two unit in Cleveland that went not long ago. So all of a sudden, I found myself pretty much GP with Quantum on those deals, and then LP on those same deals as well, putting money on an LP along with some other me. some other deals. It is, but I you know I, I'm. I do have the itch to like, you know what? I want to, I want to have my stuff as well. So this most recent exit, which will be, but as we're recording this in about a week, um, yeah, I'll put some into the, our next quantum deal, which we have under contract. And then I, yeah, I want to buy something. I want to have something active. I don't like the idea of like, you know, nothing is actually mine in my name other than my own home. Um, so we'll get there. But what I love about what you do though, so there's a couple of parallels here. Like I'm big on the meetup game. I had a, a huge meetup for a long time. In fact, I had chapters around the country, right? And and it brought me deals. It brought me capital. It brought me a lot of stuff, right? Credibility even for that matter. So I think that's amazing. But what I love about what you said earlier, and I think this is so important, is you don't have to be all things in the real estate game. You don't. In fact, it's better if you're not, to your point. Like, I'm the same as you, man. Like, I can underwrite a deal. Like, I Put me in front of a Michael Blanc spreadsheet or whatever, and I, I can go through and <laughs> underwrite a deal. But man, I want to cap myself after, you know, like I, I just, it's just not my, <laughs> it's not my oh, thing. It's like, hopefully I got it right. Whatever. But man, can I have conversations with people? Can I, can I, you know, relate to investors? Can I talk about the deal? Can I market it? Can it? Absolutely. So that's where I stay in real estate. That's my, my lane that I'm in, in real estate. And you found that as well. Is that intentional? Was that intentional? Or do you plan to build and scale based on that? Or I'm just kind of, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how you arrived at the place where your role in real estate is now, you know, not to be, even though you have the company, it's not to be the, the, the everything that, you know, you don't, you don't use every tool that you, that, that has to be used, I guess. You're only doing certain things. Was that intentional or, or are you structuring your business that way? Yeah, a little bit of both. So, I mean, this is an awesome question. I mean, I love this line of question because I think people can learn, obviously that's part of podcasting areas, like yes. tell people your mistakes. So, it, it was intentional, but it was through what I'll describe as like pain points. So um, again, when I, when I started out, I was like, I don't know, not necessarily anti-partnership, but like semi-anti-partnership. Like I was, I want to be very, very specific about the people I worked with. So early on, I met a, I met a guy in a, in a mastermind and he and I just clicked and we were also investing in the same location. So my personal favorite market is Tulsa, Oklahoma. Like mm. I love the market. I love our manager. There's just so many reasons why I like it. And he was investing there as well, or at least looking to invest because neither one of us had, had done a deal yet. 
So I was like, Hey man, you want to connect? We can meet up in Tulsa, you know, spend a week and checking out the market and get to know each other and all that stuff. And we just clicked. And so early on, it was just the two of us. And we were both basically sharing duties on underwriting, calling brokers. We were kind of doing it all. And I think early on, a lot of times in a, in a weird way, I'm glad I did. Cause I feel like I know how to your point, like I can look at a Michael Blanc spreadsheet and underwrite all day. I just don't like it. Same as you, right. but it was good to learn all of the skills. And then pretty quickly we were both like, man, this underwriting thing sucks. Like deal flow was there, <laughs> but we were both like, is it your turn or my turn to like bite the bullet on actually underwriting these deals? So I ended up meeting a guy in my meetup and his name's Shane. And he's, he was obviously very, very smart. So I said, Hey man, can I pay you hourly to uh, underwrite some deals for us? Cause I just wanted to kind of test them out, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he was like, sure. And so we ended up paying him for a few deals and I was like, okay, this guy's a million times better at underwriting than, than both of us combined. He's just fast, super smart. Just how his brain works. Oh, I love this. And so we actually oddly like right around then had submitted an LOI and we were like best and final. And I could just tell immediately, like, we're going to need some, we're going to need some help. Just not the two of us probably can't handle all the workload that's going to come before closing. So I said, Hey man, how about this? How about you partner with us on this first deal and I'll stop paying you hourly, but let's continue forward if, if we like it. And he's like, sure. And it's just blossomed from there. And so the three of us closed that deal. And then the next pinch point after we closed two or three, was like, well, asset management, kind of sucks too. Like, at least from my perspective, <laughs> like some people love it, right? That's their jam. They're like project I mean, manager mind. I'm with you. So I actually called my brother and I said, Hey dude, you're, you know, you're project manager. This is how your brain works. So you're interested to join us. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, sounds good. I was like, all right, let's, let's kind of test it out. And that's, what's kind of cool about syndication too, is you can like do a deal together. And then if, if you're not really getting along, you don't really like it, you can do a deal with like minus one person or plus another person or whatever. Like the teams tend to shift and change, which is really cool. Yep. Luckily it's all been smooth. Right. Cause I know the family thing was a little scary for me. I was like, are we going to punch each other? But it's worked out really well. And so he's kind of our, our current asset manager. And so um, John, my original partner, he kind of still loves the broker stuff. He goes to the markets. He likes mixing it up with brokers. You know, I'm kind of like you, I love networking at this point. I've sort of fallen into what I'll call a capital raiser just from being a talker. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, you know, podcast and, and just like marketing and all that stuff and then sort of leading the ship, so to speak. And so the four of us, so to answer your question, it was intentional, but it also came from pain points where it's like, well, we're needing someone to fill this gap. If I had to do it all over again, would I do it different? I'm not sure, but it's worked out really well for us. I, I hope that this, this is so on. I mean, there's so many, it's like you're in my world. Like you're literally <laughs> in, look, Ben, I, I've talked about this for people that are out there that are saying, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I have a business. I want to get into real estate. I'm not sure, you know, I don't like this. I do like whatever, right? Like, or they feel like they have to do it all. I always say there's, I think there are three like core skills or, or gifts that people have that add value to a real estate co company, especially a syndication firm. You could be an analyzer, you could be an integrator or you could be a connector. I think if you have if you have any of those three skills, whether you have any real estate experience or syndication experience whatsoever, it doesn't matter. If you're if you're the type that geeks out on not only not only doing the underwriting but then also like going through the cells and optimizing each one with formulaic ways to make the underwriting more efficient, like if that's your thing, that's not me. Have at it. I want you though working with me, and that's a great partner because they have that skill and that's the value they bring. Likewise, like you were saying, and I think we're on the same page with the connector. Like I like the meetup, the podcast, the this, that, the marketing, getting out in front, de facto capital raising. Right, that's that connector presence, that person who can. And this is me. I could do this all day, and then after I'm done for my day, I can jump on a phone and talk to friends for the rest of the night. Like that's just my. <laughs> that's right. That's that's the energy I have. Then you've got. It sounds like your brother, more of that integrator presence, right? That person that that can take. Okay, we got the asset now, and now we need to put the plan in place, and we can see. I could see the troops on the field and every next move, the chessboard in front of me. Like I don't have that either. I, I don't like. I'm vision whatever, right? But there's people out there that can lay it out and say, I know the exact battle plan to follow in order for us to execute on this. And you have every every one of those elements, it sounds like, between you and your your, your first partner, this analyzer that you brought in as a part of the underwriter, and then your your brother as the integrator. So you're literally checking, like, 
it's like all the stuff I talk about and shout from the rooftops, like you're absolutely living and leaning into it. It's the coolest thing to hear. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you, there's not even a question there. You could go ahead and jump in if you want, but that was just came to my brain. No, no. I mean, hundred percent. So like people ask me all the time, I'm like, how, how should it be structured? I totally agree. There's really those three avenues, right? And if there's one other pain point or pinch point, then there might be one person in there beyond that, or maybe like to help with other roles. Right. But like that. Yeah. you nailed yeah. it. Like if I had, if I had to describe it of how the best way to set up specifically just syndication, I think you've nailed it on the head. Yeah. So let's talk about this for a second. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this because like I said, I'm exiting all my active stuff going uh, all syndication at this point as a GP and an LP. I invest in every one of our deals and all that stuff like you were saying. Um, but, you know, there's there's the there's the buy and hold mentality, right? Of like, you know, why would you ever sell these assets? And even syndicators, like I remember Chris Benson talking about this with Reliant, with self-storage, like, Man, on the back end, now we're exiting, but can we bring in institutional money to maybe buy out all the investors and help hold the asset long term after the six, seven year hold, which I thought was pretty smart. But the, I guess you said uh, you were challenged to play a bigger game and go in the syndication route, which it is bigger, bigger units, a bigger unit size, typically more partners, a lot of limited partners. It, you know, it's bigger in that regard. But why is that for you? Why do you feel like that's maybe better or why did you why are you going that route as opposed to well look if i buy like 80 units that me and my wife own i can just hold them like we're good like you know like the, there's that argument both ways so what's the argument for you on on going the syndication route why do you see that as the route for you yeah man again jamie you're good at your job man excellent questions like <laughs> thank you um okay a couple, couple of things like first of all when i say bigger like you're right i mean it's more units Right. But I think maybe the challenge was like, think bigger rather than stick to my lane, so to speak. Yeah. So uh, it is bigger than the unit count, but it's also bigger in like the, of the ability to grow. So you get equity on the GP side as well as the LP side in these deals. So there's a little bit of that, right? Like you're grabbing some equity per deal that your work put in. But the other thing is like, it's my personality to love to help others and also to like collaborate. And, I, and that's really what syndication is. Like we're offering people, you know, we got investors who are dentists, doctors, lawyers, you know, and all the a teacher, a, good, a friend of mine is like good teacher. Like they just have extra cash, but they don't have time or they don't necessarily want to spend the time to learn what a good investment looks like. So you're providing this opportunity for your friends and family. And sometimes people you meet, and it's also benefiting you. So for me, it's also like this connection piece of like, we're all more or less working together for one end game. Typically speaking, it's always a risk, right? But typically you're gonna make some money in these investments. So that's part one. Part two is basically the other thing was like, my mind was like, okay, my wife and I have this decent income. Like as an engineer, I made, I would say middle-class wages, like not great, not good, but we were, what we were good at was saving money. So what I could do is like, okay, every year we can save 20 grand, let's say, and buy one more rental. And that was kind of where my mind was. It was like, okay, one rental per year, 15 years from now, we'll have 15 rentals. And my my mentor was like, dude, you got to think bigger. And you, you're just not thinking of the way you could potentially scale faster. And that's kind of what syndication can offer as well. Um, because things tend to just sort of, move quicker than you can keep up with sort of. But what I mean is it'll sneak up on you. Like we have a deal that we're exiting that will exit under a year. And wow. it just, the amount of money that you can make. And it's just a year's gone by like, like so fast, you know, and, and so much has happened on the property. We just, you know, got a ton of turns done. We have the property looks wholly different, better tenant class, to be honest. And it will sell and we'll all make some money. And pretty soon I'm like, wow, well, that is the kind of pace that we you could potentially run. And it's just through collaboration and teamwork. And, and you can't, I mean, you can maybe, but you can't really do it on your own at that speed, but as a group, you can. And so that's really, that's kind of what I mean by like going bigger was just thinking bigger more than anything. I like that, man. And you know, it's funny. I talk to, it depends on who you talk to. Like if you talk to uh, some some active type investors who who are looking at the LP route to invest in something like what you do or what I do, you know their their mindset is yeah, but the syndicator makes all the money. 
But if you're the syndicator, right, you're looking at it like, I don't make the money until like you make this, this, and this first, right? Like yeah, you got to yeah. get your prep, you got to get your money back. And then I get a share of the profits after that, right? So like the money is on the other end, the LP is getting the money, especially for the time committed, right? Um, but I think to your point, like it, it's, if you're, if you're an active investor in mind, then don't be an LP. But for me, what I like about what I'm doing is there's a, there's like a, a value of my time perspective. Like I remember when, when I went the syndication route, partnered with Mark Henteman uh, and Nick Amaluxin and Cliff, uh, Mark and Nick both being GoBros. When I partnered with them with Quantum, at the time I had a 22 unit under contract with another business partner that, like, that we were doing all of our active stuff with. And I remember when he asked, I was like, I got to get rid of this 22 unit because we're going to have to put together, you know, the, the business plan. We got to get the property manager in place, oversee that property manager, go through all the unit turns, do all this stuff. So we literally wholesaled it for like 15 grand or something. Nice. Maybe we'll got rid of it. We did something with it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and over here with quantum now, like, you know, I understand what's happening with the assets. I understand, you know, what the what the deal is and what the terms will be and how we're able to achieve what we're going to achieve for the investors. But then once I, you know, like somebody else did all that work, showed it to me, and now I could say, oh, that excites me. Let me share that excitement with people. Like I'd rather spend my time actively in real estate in the stuff I really, really enjoy, which is why I believe in the syndication model, right? And then of course, on the LP side, I invest in other people's deals as well. It's just, it's my mind. Like I'd rather focus here. I like brand. I like, I like online education. I like what I do with emerge assembly. Like, that's where I like spending my, my active energy more so than yeah. Property management calls or, or walk in the property to, to make sure that the, you know, that the flooring was put in right or whatever the case may be. So I think that's the, yeah. that's the difference. Would you say? Totally. Yeah. And I think like, it's again, it's like personality based, right? But like I've yeah. learned over time that I'm motivated by progress. Like, I'm, I really love to watch progression and, and get finer tuned and get a little bit better. Um, I, maybe not that, but to your point, like, where do I spend my time? Where do I prefer to spend my time? And if I can spend my time, like you're describing like this, I mean, I would do podcasts all day. I mean, we we've talked about this already, but like that's progress and that's different to your point than like going to check the trim color or, or whatever, like, so I think we're totally aligned in that sense as well, but you have to basically take a like really hard look in the mirror. What do you like doing? What, Cause if you do like doing that stuff, then maybe it is better to buy a fourplex down the road. So I get that question a lot too, as I'm sure you do is like, where's the best place to be in real estate? And my answer is it totally depends on your personality. Cause there's a million ways to make money. You can buy notes, right? You could you can pa invest passively if you've got some cash. So, yeah. you know, I think maybe when I'm, 60, <laughs> I'll really love to just invest passively just because I'll maybe be tired of it. I'm just guessing. Right. But for now, I don't really want to just be a passive investor. I want to be both. I want, I love the, like the hunt. I love like finding the deal. I love like being excited. You know, I love talking to investors. I really do love like talking to a new investor and say, here's what we're doing. Talked to a new investor yesterday. And his first question was, is this a pyramid scheme? <laughs> <laughs> and yes. so like, yeah, of course. Well, you have to, you have to buy in, but no, it's not. Right, and you right. have to tell your friends to buy in, but no, That's it's right. not a pyramid right. scheme. Yeah. No, but like, it is actually a challenge to, to talk to people and convince them this isn't some sort of Ponzi scheme. And yeah. so I get a lot out of that as well. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it's hard to answer the question. Every person's different for me. Yeah. It sounds like you and I are very similar in that sense, but it just works because I enjoy it so much. And I have we are. money is something I, I like. I love being part of a team and I love what real estate does, right? I love the impact of, I just don't know of a better wealth builder. And, and, you know, I love what wealth is not like, you know, uh, what's his name? Scrooge McDuck, you know, money. Like I just want to, you know, hoard it in a corner, but what it can do, the ability to contribute, the ability to change lives, the ability to build legacy, all of that. So I love what wealth does. I love that real estate to me is the most clear and easy and simple and impactful wealth builder. And I love being part of a team, but it's funny you say that Grant Warrington sometimes co-hosts with me on this show. And we've had this conversation at a certain point. He's like, man, I would love to fly in my private helicopter over all of my assets and be like, I own that. He loves construction. He loves everything about it. And I'm like, I don't want to know what I own. Like at a certain point, <laughs> like when I'm 60 yeah. or 70 or 80, like, I don't want to know what I own. I just want the checks coming in. So to your point, I'll probably pivot to passive more so as I age and become, you know, a little bit less wanting to, to, to kind of go. But right now that fire is in me. So I like being on both sides.
I love that answer. Love Something that. else we share is this uh, that you've talked about is this um, adventurous spirit. I mean, you did this drive all the way down to the tip of South America. I've obviously moved to the Dominican Republic, uh, and you were talking a little bit before we started recording about you know at a point maybe it was after recording I don't remember, but uh, at a point maybe making a, a one year taking a year break with the kids and going somewhere or whatever. Talk a bit about that. Is that part of your lifestyle design? Is it like, wow, that South America thing really unlocked the desire to repeat that sort of exercise? Give me a little bit more on that. What's the dream? What's the vision? Yeah, I mean, I love that. And, and again, like part of this is basically through some coaching, like through some help of like, hey, what's the why? Like, why are you doing all this? You know, and I, I would encourage anyone to like really, really ask that question and talk about your why and also talk about your vision. So again, I mean, you're asking all the questions I would ask. This is incredible. So Two, two ways to answer the question is yes, that is kind of our long-term vision is to travel as much as we can. I do want, um, I do want my kids to have like some of the, you know, what I'll call like American dream kid grow up thing. Like they deserve yeah. to have friends and play sports and that stuff, but they're still young. So for now we're like, okay, two years from now, we could either homeschool like you guys have done living in another country, um, something like that is pretty heavy on our, on our to-do list. And then, yeah, the South America trip was amazing. I have had the blessing to travel quite a bit in my life. Um, and through lots of avenues, like I was a missionary for a while and traveled all over the world. And then, you know, this trip, my wife and I took was, you know, lots and lots of countries in South America and lots of cultures. And it was nice. It was all one language the whole way, but we got to like experience that. And so a huge part of our vision moving forward is, yeah, like we want to show our kids more of the world. And what does that look like? We're not really totally sure, but the plan right now is to take a year off with them starting in, let's say, summer of 24. And homeschool, our, our oldest will be in second grade. And our youngest will have, will start kindergarten upon our like return, basically. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of by design, like the age and the time that we're selecting. But our vision is absolutely that, like be able to spend a bunch of time with them, build a world where I can do this somewhat remotely. I mean, you have to fly back and look at a property here and there, but like, sure. uh, which you probably have experience with, yeah. but that's kind of like our, our vision. Yeah. It's like show, show our kids more culture in the world. And we love that stuff. So I hope yeah, that answers the question. It does. I was just in LA this past weekend. Not, I mean, it was for other reasons, but the point is like, when I need to get back, I go back. Um, but I think you're spot on with the age. Cause if I'm hearing it right, you're five and two minus seven and four, our kids are at the exact same uh, spread, right? So you oh, yeah. would be targeting the same age, seven and four, essentially. And I've said this, like any older, or much older for the older one, like nine, 10, you're starting to get into like mom and dad aren't the coolest people anymore in their lives, right? They're going to yeah. want to your point. I got my sports teams. I got my things. I do my things with other kids and all that stuff. So we really felt a sense of almost urgency. Like if we're going to do this, this is the best time asking them to do it at 15 when, you know, yeah, they would be the most aware and the most able to take advantage of whatever also going to be the most closed off and the most hatred they're going to display for you. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so my, my business partner, engineering company, he, he did that. He like, basically they went sailing for two months nice. and took, took this last summer off. And, you know, so his, his kids are all teenagers and they were all honestly kind of pissed off at him because they were like, I want to work. I want to football practice. I got my girlfriend, you know, all this stuff. And I think mm -hmm. it worked out okay, but it was a battle. Like he felt like he had to drag them to that sailboat. And, uh, you know, to your point, I agree. There is some urgency, man. Like it's now or never, so to speak. And you only have one, one bit of time with these kids. And yeah. so you got to take it. So, I mean, I commend you, man. Like lots of people talk about it, but you're there, you're doing it. And so we, yeah, we'll have way more to talk offline about this because I'll pick your brain a lot about what it looks like. But ultimately, we're, yeah, we want to do something very similar to what you're doing. Whatever I can do to help, man. Whatever I can do to help. Talk about the Real Estate Mindset Podcast. Interesting name. I love the name. So talk about why that name and and what do you seek to serve with, with your podcast? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, again, like I was sort of playing off my own, not failures, but things you can learn from, right? Like... Yeah. I basically needed to shift my mind to, to think about partnerships, think about growth, think a little bigger. And then I, the more I learned about mindset, it's kind of a buzzword right now. Like it's a little bit annoying because it's so everywhere, but it's so true. You yeah. got to stick with the mind first and success will follow. And lots of listeners here, right? Like the GoBros, I think lots of people will say, yeah, of course. 
But there's a lot of people out there who've never heard that message or maybe not heard it in the right way yeah. to really resonate with them. So the goal of the podcast is to basically say, yeah, we talk about real estate. Yeah, we talk about syndication, but I have a series of questions at the end based around mindset. And the goal is to say, what are successful people doing? And what is their mindset? And how can we learn from that? So that's really the goal of the podcast is to get that word out is like, you got to start in your mind first, get your mind right, get that vision, get that why. And then we can learn from super successful people. And I've had quite a few uh, Go Abundance folks on and, and just learn so much from, hey, you guys are having success in whatever it is you're doing. What are you doing? There's a bunch of common threads. And so it's a pretty cool, pretty cool series of questions to kind of hear common answers from. What do you, what's the, so you coach people as well, if I, if I'm understanding correct, you coach people around mindset, real estate, kind of the com combination of the two, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's funny. So typically how it starts out is I'll tell, tell I'll coach people in, in my pitch is more or less, I'll show you how to do a syndication. Like yeah. if you stick with me for a period of time, let's say a year, more, more than likely, if you follow, you know, the steps, you'll probably have your first deal. I mean, it is market dependent. It is all those things, right? But you'll be ready for your first deal within a year easily. But what ends up happening over time is like it morphs into that mindset stuff. Mm. Because I'll say, sure, here's step seven of 40. But before you do that, why are you doing this? What do you want to do syndication for? You know, and that so the coaching kind of morphs into that. And then, you know, if it, it just, it, it, that's typically the route that it goes. So yeah, I've had some success with coaching as well. And I really enjoy it. I really love to sort of show people how to do this business. I love real estate because it's so, I mean, man, the pie is so big and there's yeah. no reason to be anything, but, you know, abundance mindset, right? Like help people out, tell the, tell the, you know, pitfalls, stuff like that. If you have a coach that you can ask specific questions, it's really powerful. So I do, you know, coach people how to do syndication, but it, it tends to morph into a little bit of both. It, it, what's the what's the thing that you hear most often that triggers the mindset sort of avenue? Because I agree. I, I think, look, coaching, coaching and consulting are two very different things, right? Consulting is I got to teach you the steps, and you can learn that in books. You can learn that through through an expert, like what you do. You're teaching. Hey, here's the steps. Uh, you can give me every step to certain things, but if I'm not, you could teach me all the steps to bungee jumping, right? But if I'm not, if I'm not ready here to jump <laughs> off of a damn cliff, then I'm not, I, thanks for the steps. Like I, I'm not there yet. Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to step on my feet, but I'm not jumping. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Right. So what is the, what's the block? Is there a one or two thing that you hear? Like, that's almost like, almost like you could just record yourself on one of these, one of these conversations and play it for everyone else you talk to, whether you're formally coaching them or not formally coaching them. What's the block that you hear most often? You know, honestly, it's not necessarily a block per se. It's basically me. It's me asking that specific question. Be like, why are you doing this? And then it's, I'm actually really annoying on that specific coaching call. I love so what I'll do is be like, yes, like, why are you doing that? And they're like, oh, I want to make money. Why do you want to make money? Oh, because it can buy stuff. Okay, well, why do you want to buy stuff? Oh, because uh, I like cars. Uh, no, let's go a little deeper. Oh, actually, I want to like uh, buy a vacation. Why do you want to do a vacation? You can see the line of questioning here. And then usually what ends up happening is they're like, well, I want to spend more time with my kids. Good, okay. Why do you want to spend more time with the kids? And so it's usually this one specific call where it's like kind of a bottomless why from me and they, you know, most people tend to get a little annoyed by it, but then they come out with this like, aha, like I have wanted to make money just because society tells us it's good. Yeah. When in reality, what I want is time freedom or time with my kids or, you know, some people just want money. I mean, some people just like nice things and that's totally okay. But to understand and know what that why is, then you can start digging into cool. Here's the next step to syndication. And here's why you're going to take more action because you, there's more power behind it. Um, you know, so if they hit a roadblock, a lot of times that's a, that's a time to like bust out that call. And so it's not really one specific one. It's more like, let's look at your vision, your why. And to your point, man, consulting and coaching are totally different. Um, this book behind me, you know, is best ever book. It's a oh, pretty yeah. good, pretty good it, book yeah. about tell you everything. You can read it and it's basically A to Z, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can read that book and you don't need me or coaches, but you know, if you have, if you have someone there helping you along the way, plus that like other tweak of here's some mindset tips, then I think you'll go further faster.
Yeah, no, I completely agree. I love the why in, in Emerge, we have an exercise called five whys to get you there, right? Five whys. So it, it, it's it's going deeper and deeper each time. And at your point, you you hit an emotional moment. But I like bottomless why. I might have to steal that because it, it, sometimes <laughs> five isn't enough. Honestly, like, you know, people stay yeah. fairly superficial or they, you know, it's like, you know, uh, they 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 take the very surface, like the crust of the earth sort of thing and break that into 17 whys. And it's like, we haven't even breached you know, like the next layer, never mind the core, right? So to your point, like you got to keep asking that question. And there's an emotional moment that triggers when you could see it on people like, yeah. you know, they, they just, yeah. they shift, they, they, <laughs> they, they like, you know, wipe their face, like something you, you know, when you hit that, why, when they like, they're boxed in, it's not frustration that they can't come up with an answer. It's like, we just hit something. And I love that moment because that's the breakthrough. So I, I, it's just so much freaking alignment. It's insane. Um, uh, you want to do a deal together? <laughs> yeah, we should, right? Like, oh, we, do, we, do we just become best friends, best syndication friends. <laughs> I'll see the DR. All right, I'm booking a ticket right now. That's right. Yeah, come on down. We had four bedrooms. You could have one. Um, wow, man, amazing. This is this is incredible. I'm just thinking through all of what we talked about so far. So, so what is next? So you've got six syndications that you've done. You've got your coaching business. You're doing this this. Um, uh, the podcast and marketing, what you do, the mindset piece. What's next? What is the vision? What's the big dream besides the travel in a couple of years? Or is that really the culmination of it? No, it's, I mean, so a couple of things. One, I'm building like, so with this, with this like consulting, we'll call it kind of building an educational platform because it'd be nice to be able to point coaching students like this. So that'll come very soon. It's in works yeah. right now. Nice. Um, so you can just say, hey, go look at module four and I'll walk you through it, but this will, then you can go back and watch the recording over and over and over. So building like an educational platform, because I, I truly believe in education. Like people ask me, where do I get started in real estate? I'm like get educated one. Um, and then kind of, then we can talk about the next steps because podcasts like this, there's plenty of really good real estate podcasts, get educated one. So that's really my next step. And then, you know, starting to like think of ways to, teach people and educate people. That's really kind of the ultimate goal. I mean, of course we want more deals and we want to continue to syndicate, but that's, that's kind of in, in, I don't know, like a cog in the machine at this point, like we've kind of dialed our systems. We can always do better and we will continue to do better. But yeah, ultimately for me and my family, it's, it's more time freedom. It's more like focused time with my kids and more travel with them was be kind of the ultimate goal. I love it, man. Talk about GoBundance for a minute. You've been a member, is it a year? Yeah, a little over a year. It was like August of last year. Yeah. Um, so yeah. what what has it been? Uh, you know, what takeaways do you have? How have you leveraged GoBundance? Just anything you want to talk about as far as GoBundance? Yeah, I mean, I'm really glad you asked because I, I I'm glad because I even in my mind we're walking into this this studio, I was thinking I really hope that we can talk about the GoPod itself. So sure. I will say GoBundance has been has been amazing. So if anyone's out there listening and you're on the fence just dive in, man. It's, it's worth every penny. But for me specifically, the GoPod has been incredible. And I hope these guys listen to it. But the, the guys that I have ended up being with, it's just such a powerful group. And being able to meet them in person was also hugely powerful. We all met in person with the exception of one guy in Detroit, but we actually met up in person with him in Park City. So I've met them all in person. That was a cool connection. But we meet weekly and we just share our wins, our struggles, you know, and you know, the one sheet alone, like starts to bring out some conversations. Yeah. So, um, you know, leveraged in that sense, some girl bros have invested with us and become friends. Some girl bros, like, you know, we'll, we'll collaborate, right? Like ask questions of each other, like, Hey, what are you finding on this? Or what's a trick you pulled here? But really for me, the key is the go pod. And I, I don't think I'd ever say enough about it. It's just such a cool group. And you may not remember, but early on we were like, what is a GoPod? How do we do this? And we invited you on because Harvey is a friend of yours, right? He's like, Hey, yeah, can yeah. you come on and kind of talk to us about it? So you gave us a few tips and tricks of how to run it. I think every GoPod probably runs a little differently, but ours is, is kind of finding a stride and it's just so valuable, man. Like just having guys to talk to you about your struggles and your wins and questions. And, and we text all the time, like even this morning, you know, Harvey was like, Hey, I, I need some advice on the specific deal. And every one of us fired back, like, probably not terribly helpful answers, but <laughs> no, but it's good to talk about there. So I, yeah, I think yeah. the GoPod thing is super cool. So for me personally, that's, that's really the golden nugget. Oh man. I, I, I love hearing that. I do remember jumping on cause yeah, Harvey and I had a connection and um, it's true. The two things that always jump up and I've done a few of these people have asked, Hey, can you jump on? I've had my GoPod for four years. And I think the first thing I say to every one of them is please take the pressure off yourselves to make this epic. 
right? Like don't, it, you know, every week is not going to be like, wow, we had the greatest takeaways and we pushed each other. Like it's going to be some weeks that are just sort of meh. Sometimes we're just kind of conversation, you know, getting together and just locking out a bunch of noise that all of you seem to have right now and just, just chatting. Right. But uh, that was one. And the second one, and it sounds like you guys are leaning into this is the, when you're going into this experience of being in a GoPod or really go abundance in general, looking for the, the return that you're going to get, that's where I think they falter. Whereas if you fully know what Harvey's working on or whomever, like if you know what somebody else's need is and you're coming into the pod in service, you're going to get, you're going to gain from, you're going to get investors. You're going to get, you know, support. You're going to get everything that you need by simply serving. So I love hearing them and that's great to hear with the pod. And uh, yeah, I was going to say, it's been a bit now. I know you, I mean, I think I remember, did I, did I talk to you when you did join? I'm sure. I'm sure I did. No. Yeah. So actually it's funny. Like I, I did, I, you called me. So I was in Dallas when I joined and I was actually talking to Brandon Turner about GoPot or about uh, Go Bunnets, Go right? Like, yeah. so he was a speaker there at a Michael Blanc event. Oh yeah. And I just pulled him aside and, uh, and I had had him on, uh, I don't think, I, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. I had one other connection with him. So I was like, Hey man, I know everyone wants to talk to you, but can I have five minutes? You know, I basically was like, how's it going? And then I just said, how, what do you think of Go Bunnets? And he's like, it's awesome. And so then basically I decided to, to right. join. And so you gave me a phone call and, and it was awesome. It was a really good connection. I even remember where I was standing, like oddly when we talked on the phone, but it's just been a cool thing. And, and I really want to echo what you said too, about like giving, not taking is like, mm -hmm. if you go into, I mean, really anything, this is true, but go bonus yeah. too is like, if you go into it, what can I, what can I, how can I serve? You're going to get more from it than, Hey, this is a group of, you know, successful men, you know, what can I grab from this group? Like right. that's lame and you're, you're going to get less from it. So service is huge. And I've learned that from a lot of people around. I mean, most people are there to help. Yeah. It's tough though. Like we're all consumerists, right? We grow, we've grown up to think like 10,000 or $15,000, I get car or vacation or product or item or whatever. And this is like, what, what do I get for my 10,000? Like, well, you get to yeah. serve. Like, what do you mean I get to serve? I just gave ten. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good way to say it. Well, you get to spend more of your time helping other people. Right, right, right. Yeah, you get <laughs> cost you a lot of money. <laughs> that's right. It's going to cost you a bunch of money to help other people. But I said it before, man. Like, I, you know, this past weekend I went to L.A. Uh, because I went to Seth MacFarlane's birthday party. Right, like yeah. that's. That's because I met Mark, who's a family guy writer. He's a partner in GoBundance. And because the reason why Mark asked me to be a partner was because when I met him, all I wanted to do was help him connect with people uh, that he wanted to get connected to, right? He was a newer member and he was trying to figure things out. I'm like, oh, let me connect you to this guy, that guy, that guy. Uh, going to a Reds game, meeting Bob Castellini, same thing. Like, I, you know, I just wanted to help him meet people. He was a new champion. And I wanted to help him meet some of the other champions that are in the wealth management business. Not nobody else is in the baseball ownership business, but not that I know of anyway, but um, you know, like it's just helping people like that. And I, I realize that like whenever I forget about the return and just focus on the give, the return is everything that I'm doing is because I, when I, because I'm, I'm in service of some sort and I'm not like the best, but I'm just saying, like, you know, I've, I've served in some way and I could see the actual return on that service. Not because I'm not doing it for that. Like, oh, if I help Bob, I can go to a baseball game. That's not why I'm doing it. But, you know, it's amazing how it does happen. So when, when we say it, it's true. Like, here's your pay your 10 grand so that you could help other people. It's like, man, the level of connection and the level of resource that these people have, because they've all paid 10 or 15 grand and can to join a, a group of other like-minded men, like their level of connection is going to a, you know, a, 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 a producer creator of one of the most iconic shows in history's birthday party or sitting in the owner's suite at a baseball game or whatever. Like that's the level of connection that you get from your service. So anyway, no, I love uh, it. Super true. I'm sorry. No, it's super true. No, I, I'm just, again, I love it, man. Everything you said is just like, that's why I wanted to echo it. It was just like service will obviously create, not obviously will maybe not obviously give you some back. And that's the case. It's super true. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. All right. Let's wrap this with a question from the abundance card game. The question, <laughs> King of Diamonds. Uh, let's see if you want to admit this. Do you text and drive? Uh, without my kids all the time. For some reason, I'm like, my life's not that important. But like when my kids are in the car, I don't text and drive. So that's the honest truth. I have a pretty good system. What's I drive with system? my knee. Like I'm amazing at driving with my knee. No. I mean, yeah, the answer is 
I do. I'm getting a little bit better. Like the voice text thing. When my kid's in the car, I'm like, eh, nah, no texting. So that's the truth. My wife is mandated. No texting with the kids in the car. And down here, I'm afraid to be thrown in a Dominican jail. So it's kind of dried up my driving and texting <laughs> career. Like that's not the prison. That ain't the prison I want to be in. So <laughs> run over. Cause they have to do the motorcycles are frigging everywhere. Like if I run over somebody, I mean, not that I want to hurt somebody anyway, but mm-hmm. you know, like if I run over somebody, who do you think's getting taken aside? You know? <laughs> oh yeah. Be, oh yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, that wouldn't be good. Eric, how could people reach out, learn more about you, Wild Oak, whatever you want to leave them with? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of all on my website, Wild Oak Capital. Um, and I love to talk, man, obviously. So my email is eric at wildoakcapital.com. Absolutely email me. I'd love to talk about really anything. And then truly back to what we are saying is like service. Like if I can help you, don't be shy. Love to have an email. That's probably the best way to reach me. Beautiful. If you uh, enjoyed this episode and all of our episodes, always helps to get a rating review, five star, preferably on uh, iTunes or or uh, Spotify or on YouTube. Drop a comment. Let us know what you thought of this episode. And uh, Eric, man, I appreciate you coming in. Thanks, Jamie. My pleasure.